This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hello, and welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show. And our Moonlighter for today is Paul Shirley. He's a repeat Moonlighter, one of the few, one of the proud, one of the repeat Moonlighters. Of course, most of you probably remember Paul Shirley from his basketball playing days back at Iowa State University. After Iowa State, Paul had a long professional basketball career. And since his basketball career wrapped up, Paul has transitioned to being a writer. The last time he had a book come out, he had a book called The Stories That I Tell on Dates about three years ago come out, and we had him on the podcast to promote that book. He's got another book coming out. This one is a fictional tale called Ball Boy. I've read it. I highly recommend it. It's a really fun read. You should go check out Ball Boy. And so Paul is back on the podcast to have a freewheeling conversation with us here on the Moonlight Graham Show. And this truly was a freewheeling conversation. We talk about everything from Iowa State's black uniforms to baseball cards to our favorite books. And I think it might be safe to say that Paul and I might be best friends after this one. This was a really fun conversation. But you guys let us know. You let me know what you think of Paul and I's relationship after this one, because there might be a chance for Paul and I to get together for a third special episode where he and I sit down, we may crack a few beers, and we re-watch that Iowa State versus Michigan State game that happened in the Elite Eight, man, about 20 years ago now. And that would be a really fun part three of the Shirley trilogy to have here on the Moonlight Graham Show. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy this episode of the podcast. Go check out Paul's new book. It's called Ball Boy. You can buy it online at Amazon. And as always, folks, if you like what we're doing here on the Moonlight Graham Show, Make sure to subscribe to our podcast wherever it is that you get your podcast and leave us a five-star review. You can also follow the show on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We love hearing from you guys each and every week. So enjoy today's episode with two-time Moonlighter, Paul Shirley. Welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show. You know, it's Thanks, been a man. couple of years since you were back. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, I uh, yes, I have fond memories of our first my first trip to the Moonlight Graham show. Good answer. So, is is your name here the process? Is that in re- any relation to Matt Campbell? No, but he would probably be a good person to talk to about that. I um, so I I started a company called the Process uh, okay. about a year and a half ago because I don't know if you are familiar at all, but um, I run a thing called writer's block here in LA. Yep. I'm following uh, you guys. And so we uh, came to the realization that what we do applies, not just to writers, but kind of to anybody who's trying to accomplish a long-term goal, like build a football program, for example. Um, And uh, that we could also take that online. And then COVID hit. Uh, and we actually got kind of an amazing chance to test this out. So we have spent the last year mostly dealing with writers. And then this January, we launched the process kind of for anybody who is, as we say, trying to be productive, but not, right. we we talk about like, there's, there's a lot of value in not just being busy, but actually being productive. Yeah, that's a good question or a good topic. Like how, as a writer, do you, can you tell the difference between like brainstorming and spacing mm-hmm. off? Yeah. I, and I think that applies kind of to, to all of us in this world, right. Where we are left now with in some ways too much time. Uh, I think one of the most important things we can all do is uh, crank down the amount of time we give ourselves to work on things. Uh, and also realize that uh, if you can achieve a state of flow, or of deep work that you actually don't have to work that long, uh, but you do have to build in some, some safeguards and some constraints in order to reach that. Um, Part of the, the process idea came from this book I'm working on called the process is the product, uh, which really goes back to my basketball days um, and talks about this idea of how to actually build systems and routines so that you can achieve things that, um, maybe are conceptual or, or really long-term. Uh, one thing that I talk about a lot is that when I would go to basketball camps growing up in Kansas, um, 
you'd always get, you, you probably went to these sorts of camps where they bring in a guy from a local college to tell you like what it takes to make it right. You yep. you're, you're sitting there with your, your nubbly basketball. And I know your... all of you kids want to play junior college basketball. Well, let yeah. me tell you how. I know your dream is to play at Indian Hills Community College. Right. Um, so yeah, those people are all really impressive when you're eight years old. And one thing I noticed is they would always talk about how much work was involved. And one thing they would say, it seems like it came up all the time. They'd be like, yeah, I shoot a thousand shots a day. Right. And I, and one time in high school, I remember trying to shoot a thousand shots and it took like four hours and I couldn't lift my arm the next day. And so I was just thinking, well, I'm just never going to be good enough. Cause I can't, I'm clearly, this is beyond me. Right. Right. So then, um, as I aged and, and, you know, got to Iowa state, and then got beyond Iowa state, I realized that those, those guys were just lying. Like there was no truth to that at all. And that that's something that happens all the time that people are constantly trying to convince you of how hard they're working. And they usually use like these large numbers to try to impress you. So they'll say like, yeah, I'm working 70 hours a week. And people I, you know, in, in the world of writing, people will always be like, well, yeah, you know, I'm writing for four hours a day. And I want to say like, well, what the hell, where are these books and stuff? Like, what, are, what are you doing in these four hours? You know what those people are really good at? They're really good at, at tricking people or kids' parents into mm-hmm. paying for their services, yeah, but they're not true. actually helping the kid, but they're really good at tricking the parents to give up the money to do it. Totally. Um, and I, you know, I, I struggled when my basketball career was done with the, with the writing thing, because I didn't understand that it was just like sports that I needed to figure out how to do it for a certain amount of time, basically every day for me, it's six days a week, but basically every day, that amount of time though, it doesn't need to be three or four hours. It needs to be one hour and it needs to be hyper concentrated where there's my phone's not on. I'm not accessing the internet. I am completely clear of mine, which was also very true in sports. Um, I think one of the reasons we don't understand this when it comes to the day-to-day is because it seems really evident with sports that your body can only take so much like well I can't work out for six hours because my body will just fall apart but that's also true for our brains right like you can't concentrate for four hours at a time you can concentrate a lot of cases the longest you can go is 50 minutes and in most cases it's more like 17 minutes but we don't really process that and we think we can just like push ourselves and then what ends up happening is you don't do any concentrated work because you're just sort of flailing through it the whole time right so as it relates to your book ball boy here which i i just read read and there's a lot i love about it i want to get into some of that but from when you came up with like the idea and the concept of the book Mm -hmm. how long did it take you once you were like in the flow as you say to write um so that book uh it I think it started six years ago with kind of brainstorm and all of that. I have a, a fairly rigid and specific methodology to writing books in that I only spend three months on any one draft. So I will spend an hour a day, six days a week for three months on a draft. So the first draft of ball boy was probably more like, I'm going to write 1500 words. I'm going to try to do that in about an hour. And I'm going to do that six days a week. And I'm going to give myself three months to do that. And then that, when that was done, I went away from that book and worked on different books, probably for two more three month periods. And then I much more than more likely than not came back and wrote the second draft of ball boy. And then at that point I gave it to somebody to read and, and kind of got some feedback. So it, it feels like there's this kind of assembly line or a process, I guess, for me, when it comes to writing books where It is about building in these constraints of saying, I know it's going to take a really long time, but in some ways, the longer it takes, the better the book will be because other ideas will seep in and and I'll get better as a writer in that time. Um, I think that's frustrating to people when it comes to writing a book or starting a business or whatever it is, just this idea that it does take a long time. It's just that it doesn't have to be drudgery constantly. So when you have a book like Ball Boy, right? And mm-hmm. right away, you you get introduced to Gray Taylor, the main character of the book. And it strikes me like Gray Taylor, great name, right? Like great name for a character. How long does it take you to come up with like the perfect name 
for your character in the book, like Gray Taylor and Elmer, mm-hmm. you know, his, his buddy Elmer in Kansas. And some of these names like mm-hmm. really stuck with me, uh, like Elmer's a Kansas kid and Gray yeah. Taylor is, you know, a California kid. And it just, you can say their names and, and know where mm-hmm. they're from, right? It tells yeah. a, a lot about them already. I think, you know, what's interesting about that it, when it comes to character building is that it needs to seem familiar and exotic at the same time. Right. So like, we don't know a lot of grays and what helped me, if we, if we really want to get inside baseball is that um, what I have found to be helpful in writing fiction is spending a ton of time working on the biography of who the person is before I ever start writing. So with gray Taylor, I was watching, I'm sure I was watching a lot of Friday night lights at the time. And so coach Taylor, right? Like it's, that's the family that kind of everything centers around. And so to me, that felt like a sportsy name. It also feels like it's not going to surprise people when that name is in the, in the sort of ether. And then I was thinking about, well, what, what happened when gray was born? And I thought of this idea that um, the governor of California in the 80s, 70s and 80s was gray Davis. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And so I thought of this idea of Gray's mom not knowing what her son was going to be named and then seeing a plaque in a hospital for Gray Day. It is Gray Davis, right? Um, and so I thought like, well, that would be interesting if she saw that and that was like the divine inspiration. So now that never got mentioned in the book. I think it was actually in a, an early draft, but then it re- you realize like, oh, that doesn't matter. People don't need to know where that name comes from. So that's how, like, it's weird how it's not like you just sort of spontaneously think of it. It's more just that like, well, what would be the circumstances of their lives that would lead to that being their name. So, you know, there's these other things on, on page two of your book too. Uh, there's a Toyota Camry, a silver Toyota Camry spotting. Mm. And uh, I drive a Toyota Camry, Paul, and it's silver. It's 2005. And I was just imagining like, I think his name was Mr. Espinoza or something, the mm-hmm, teacher. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm Mr. Espinoza right now. I'm the <laughs> high school teacher driving the Toyota Camry and I'm almost hitting the skateboarding kid. That's yeah. me. That's you. Good. Was I'm there glad a that resonated. Version that did, like, where did silver Toyota Camry come? Is it just the most plain Jane car in, in America? It just feels like a, it feels like a teacher's car for some reason. Um, and, and in the scene that you're talking about, like, again, t- I'm sure that your listeners are like, why are we talking about literature? But that's I what talk we're about doing. Silver Camrys a lot. On that's, this what we're t- that's what we're talking about. Um, that scene and that first chapter actually didn't get written until much later, which I, the book originally started with him arriving in Kansas. And then I was reading and thinking about it and it just didn't work. We needed to see where he was before we could see like what a change it was to arrive in Kansas for this kid. Right. The fish out of water part of the story. Yeah, totally. Um, I think that helps like you get a sense of, um, kind of gray on his own and how it, it, maybe potentially gets you into his head as like, well, wow, this is going to be very different now moving from Reseda, California to fictional town in Kansas. Yeah. Baudelaire, Kansas. Is this like an homage to Simone Baudelaire? Uh, A little bit. um, But it also felt like um, there is, there's a, there's a lake in Kansas called Merdezine, which is a French word. Um, And there's a little bit of like French uh, in, in Eastern Kansas when it, when it comes to like naming towns and stuff. So again, it, it came out of like, this feels like the sort of town that could like exist in Kansas and people wouldn't be surprised if it were there, but it, it can also be kind of universal to stand in for whatever sort of city. Right. Cause like all Midwesterners, when I saw that gray was moving to Baudelaire, Kansas, Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to stop reading right now. And, and Google find out where Baudelaire is and see if I know anybody from Baudelaire, Kansas. Sure, sure. And then, you know, one of my favorite books is um, is Centennial by James Mishner. Oh, great pick. And, and so uh, Centennial is a book that Centennial, Colorado did not exist when the book uh, was written. And now mm-hmm. there is a Centennial, Colorado, and it mm. is named after the book that Mishner wrote. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I've actually, I've been to Denver a lot and I've always seen Centennial. And I assumed that that was the, the town that inspired the book, but it was the they other way around. They just needed a new name for one of the ritzy suburbs in Denver. And so <sighs> that's where Centennial came from. And it's not actually in the same place as the book Centennial, but it's named after the book. Mm. And so I was thinking like, maybe, maybe someday there'll be a Baudelaire, Kansas named <laughs> after you yeah. know, the fictional town in Ball Boy. 
We could uh, we could rename my hometown of Meriden, Kansas. I liked, you know, one of the reasons for for coming up with a fake town is that I think, uh, and this is a lesson I've learned as a writer. It's easier for me, or it's not easier. I'm better at describing a place that I have to describe to myself, as opposed to if it's a place I already know, I forget to tell you the things you need to know about that place because it's so baked into my experience. Whereas if it's entirely my imagination, then I have to like, well, okay, what does it look like, Paul, on the cobblestone streets or whatever right. those things are? Yeah. So are we getting a sequel? Is there a chance for a sequel here? I, yeah. I mean, I actually sort of wrote it with that in mind. I don't know that, um, I don't know that that would happen necessarily. It's flattering that you would even suggest it. Um, it, it well, you, it's, I, I read it like, oh, there, there might be more here. There might be more to the Gray Taylor story here. And maybe we're just getting started with where this kid's going. You know, it's, it's, uh, this is the, the hubris of youth. And when I say youth, I mean like four years ago, when I started writing it, I was like, you know what? I could write a book about every year of his high school career, right? right. Like freshman sophomore year, sophomore year. Here we right. go. And, you know, I, I think when I, when I started it, I thought like, oh yeah, this will be like, this will be a real thing. But it, it's so dependent on, you know, the, the reception and like, do, does it resonate? Do people start telling their friends and family about it or do they not? And, you know, not to get too hokey about this idea of a process, but I really have connected to this, this thought that like you, I, as a writer, I just have to write book after book, after book, after book. And some of them will connect with people. Some of them won't. And that's okay. It's a lot like playing a, having a basketball career. Some games are going to go well. And it, really has very little to do with, you know, exactly your preparation that day. It has, pre- has to do with your preparation from a year ago or two years ago. Um, you can't control what happens in one basketball game. And so therefore I can't control like the reception of, of one book. So in sports, a lot of times we have guys that we model our game off of, right? Man, mm-hmm. I'm going to watch that guy and I'm going to try to do this, you know, Steph Curry's moves or Mike Mussina's knuckle curveball or George Brett's batting stance, you know, some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. As a writer, are there writers that maybe maybe really enjoy their work or really enjoy how they go about their process and try to emulate mm-hmm. uh, what they're doing? Certainly. Uh, it's also knowing there are writers out there that I can't be like, that's one thing that I'm learning. Uh, Like I wish I could do like Jonathan Franzen. So Jonathan Franzen writes in kind of the Tom Wolf, uh, Philip Roth school of like building these huge worlds, being able to like have these massive flashbacks uh, that last 20 minutes and then coming back to the present. And when I try to do that, it just does not work. I'm just not, that's not my forte. Um, I, I probably write a little more like, do you know who Nick Hornby is? I know who he is. I haven't read his books though. So he wrote like about a boy and high fidelity and yep. he wrote in a kind yeah, of I like the movies. It's a very light sort of like, uh, let's just tell the story and, and have a, a little bit of a light attitude around it. Um, it's not, it's by no means heavy literature. Um, and, and so I, I think that's within my skill set is to write in that vein. Uh, I'm not a guy, like I'm never going to, like I, I think some of it is like the, the way you were raised. I was raised in a in a learned household, but it was not an academic household. So we weren't just tossing around uh, six dollar words for the for just for fun. Right. And so therefore, I communicate in a fairly simple and I would say midwestern way. Uh, and I I think when I'm at my best, I understand that limitation and am able to just try to communicate according to my best vocabulary that doesn't involve uh, trying to impress people by using Harvard words. Right. Yeah. Harvard words don't go over well in, in Baudelaire, Kansas. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So how often do you think about the Michigan state game, Paul? (laughs) That that was like, uh, let's get down to business. Yeah. That was like a, like if you were an interrogator, you're like, you buttered me up and then you're like, so did you murder that woman? Um, uh, I, I think about it, uh, whenever people tweet at me about it, uh, I and no time in between. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it, it is interesting thinking about like people's perspective on, on Iowa state basketball versus my perspective of my basketball career. 
because I played so many games, right? Like there's just so many games. Um, and so it's, it's hard to uh, connect to like one particular game. Obviously that game, I think what, what I think about with that game. I mean, that is, wasn't just one particular game though. That was the only elite eight game in Iowa state basketball history. Right. True. Um, and it's the only time that I've been involved in a controversial double foul that allowed me to foul out and our coach to get kicked out and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I tell you what, I went back about a month ago and watched the game on YouTube. Oh, really? Thinking that like, it's probably not as bad as I thought. I was a middle schooler. I was super invested. Right. It's worse than I thought. (laughs) That was the last five minutes of that game are a train wreck. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's funny. I've never seen it. I've never watched it. I probably should get some beers sometime. Maybe we'll do a, we should do a moonlight gram, uh, virtual viewing of the Iowa state Michigan state game. You know, we're going to do that, Paul. That's, because... that's, that's probably the best idea we've had today for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I did actually one of those uh, with uh, an Iowa game a couple of weeks ago and it mm. blew up. I mean, it, it went viral. Okay. It, it went viral across central Iowa. So we'll do that sometime with a couple of beers. Yeah. I like that. I think for me, the, um, that Iowa state Michigan state game is, is more impactful because I, the mythology surrounding it personally, when it comes to like, as, as some of your listeners may remember, I was uh, caught crying after that game in very demonstrative fashion. Yep. And that photo was used all over the country, including in the uh, Iowa state daily on Monday morning. And um, as I have told, I think you, even you guys, um, it was mortifying to see that on the newspaper but also I think really formative. I think it has contributed to kind of my attitude about myself, like that um, it's, it's helpful to not take yourself too seriously. Right. Uh, I actually, the, the girl I'm dating right now um, keeps a, a, a Google spreadsheet uh, of the times that she cries each month. Um, so she'll, <laughs> she'll update it like, well, I saw a puppy and I started crying. Or I w- or listened to this story and I started crying. And so we were I, it was just two days ago, um, we were we were laughing about, she was like, you need to just cry already for the year. You haven't cried yet this year. Like what's going on? And so I just sent her a picture of the uh, double heartbreak newspaper photo to say like, look, I'm not opposed to crying. I'm clearly into it. It's just that it hasn't happened yet in February. What's the last book to make you cry? Ooh, um, for me... I can vividly remember the road making me cry like twice by Cormac McCarthy. Of course. Yeah. That's a good one. A lot of, a lot of father son stuff in there. Um, I I don't mean to be self-referential, but I feel like every book I've written, the ending has made me cry as the writer, Hmm. which is, I think where you want to be. Like it's, it's some of that is not like the reader is probably not going to cry at the end of ball boy, but some of it for me is like being able to get this entire story sort of wrapped up and, and finished. Um, it, it just, it, there's like a certain emotional impact that comes with that, that hits me pretty good. Yeah. I like, it reminds me of the movie stranger than fiction where Will Ferrell is kind of this already formed character and then the character is kind of living this life on his own. And the, and the writer kind of realizes that the character is its own thing. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's what you're going through a little bit when you finish the book. It's like, oh, that is Gray Taylor. Look what Gray Taylor has now accomplished. Look what yeah, he, yeah. You know, yeah, it's it, like it's sort of like I get what I would imagine a fatherhood to be like. Like you're like, oh, shit, I've taken this being through this journey and now he's able to like survive on his own. Right. Yeah. Go do uh, go do Zoom book sale. You know, go to Barnes and Noble now. Go on right. Amazon. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Paul, do you play hoops anymore? Um, I haven't touched a basketball. I mean, I've touched a basketball. I, I will say my brother was in town uh, last weekend and we actually tried here in L.A. to go to a, a court to maybe shoot around but all the rims are have metal bars uh put over them to keep people from congregating which is like the most post-apocalyptic thing that you can ever imagine right like 
yeah, let's not have people, you know, exercise and be outside. Let's keep them in their houses so they can, you know, get depressed and spread uh, viruses to each other. Anyway, that's a whole other discussion. Um, so we tried then, but other than that, I don't think I've shot a basketball in two years and I've definitely not played in a game in like four years. Uh, my body, I mean, you got to remember I'm 43 now and like, I was at towards the end of my career, went through several surgeries and then finally kind of got everything figured out. And I just don't want to mess with that. <laughs> like there's right. no, no desire to blow an Achilles in a rec game. I was actually thinking about that while I was reading ball boy, because Elmer, my, 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 one of my favorite guys, Elmer can't play football because he, he had a torn meniscus. Mm-hmm. And as a guy that's had a lot of injuries, like, you know what you're talking about when it comes to injuries, like, meniscus mm. i mean come on there's yeah. there's almost nothing to that right like right. it could have been labrum it could have been acl mm-hmm. mcl just you name achilles you mentioned it but meniscus like yeah. that's not even a ligament you know you <laughs> technically you don't even need it you know and so i like i knew you were trying to send send a message there like this is a pretty soft mother that Elmer right had. right yeah no i mean i first of all i really appreciate that you uh that you remember that. Um, and you are right that I was trying to, to get across this idea that, that Elmer's mom, even though Elmer is is basically built to play sports, uh, has told him like, you can wait on this. Um, and you know, like, I think that's, that is actually a, a, an interesting point. I've been thinking a lot about football in the last few years, especially because my Kansas city chiefs are really good. And so therefore it's easy to watch them. Right. For a long time, I was struggling to watch the NFL because of the concussion stuff and all that. Um, but I think I've come back around to really enjoying football uh, because there's for all the faults of, of all sport of all sports, there's something so valuable about connecting to a team and also about pushing yourself and yeah, sometimes you may get really hurt in, in a sport, but like, what are we living for? You don't, you don't get to live forever either, which way. So if, if there's something that if, if the game of football, for example, really connects to somebody and they feel like really engaged with the world because of how they feel on the football field, like who am I to say that's not a good idea? Even if maybe it does lead to a concussion and you are going to die five years earlier than you would have. Otherwise, like I said, you're not going to live for all time. You got to, you got to use some of this body as you've got the chance. I mean, I, who knows what my life expectancy is. I don't know that it was lengthened by playing basketball, like the various injuries I had. Um, But I think it, but I think that added so much value to my life, just when it comes to perspective, when it comes to uh, pushing myself, when it comes to learning who I was, being coached, uh, dealing with hardship, adversity, resilience, all of those things. Um, I just think like we live in a time when and I'm a little bit on a soapbox here. We live in a time when when people are so protective of their children uh, and they forget that like we need these difficult times because that's who makes us who we are. And it's what makes being alive tolerable. Right. Yeah. I mean, the highs and lows you experience in sports, the way the ridicule, the being coached, the being yelled at, Mm -hmm. the bonding with teammates, the being forced to get along with guys that you might not even like outside of the locker room, like all of that stuff they have to deal with in sports. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're not, if you don't have that, like if I didn't have that in my career, I don't know how I'd be the rest of my career. Right. I don't know how I'd be able to handle a lot of the situations that I've come up with uh, in my life. And and a lot of that, I probably because I spent too much time playing sports. Right. That was most of my experience up until my, you know, 23 years old or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, I'm grateful for all that. My shoulder hurts. I can't lift a lot of things over my, my head now, right. but like I wouldn't get, if I could, you know, go out and p- throw 150 pitches tomorrow, hell yeah, I'd be there. You mm-hmm. know, if there was some drug I could put into my arm and just go, Hey, right. you know, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Were you down? Did you pitch in college? I did. I was a you and I Panther. Oh, nice. That you were what I always wanted to be, which was a baseball player. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, uh, my old man played at Iowa state in the early eighties, along with a couple of my uncles and mm-hmm. my dream, you know, if Iowa state had a program, right. 
I just would have walked on, done whatever I could. You know what I mean? It would. Mm-hmm. I would not have. Had, it would have been the easiest recruiting ever. I would have been there. Yeah, like, being the ball. It was. I was so sad when when Iowa State cut their baseball program. Uh, mostly selfishly because in the spring when basketball would be over, I would go watch baseball games, um, just sit in those little bleachers and, and yeah. watch what was not a great baseball team, but um, which was, I think like, I mean, it's just tough when you get rid of baseball. It's, there's, it's such a, yeah. it's so ingrained in us. Um, and, and how do we get that going? How do we get to bring back baseball to Iowa state program? You let me know, Paul, because I've been okay. trying to work on it for the last 20 years here. <laughs> All right. And uh, me and Mike Green, you know, Mike Green over oh, at Iowa State, yeah. he's a big baseball guy too. His, I think his dad or his brother played at Iowa State back in the day. Mm. And so uh, I love talking Iowa State baseball w- with him and had a lot of old Iowa State baseball guys on this show talking mm-hmm. about the old days. And uh, God, it'd be a great thing if, if they brought it back. You know, Pollard, Pollard has done so many great things for Iowa State. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just a shame that his kids weren't were track runners and not baseball players. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, yeah, Iowa State. Like it's it has been fun to watch um, Iowa State. I don't know. It feels like they've gotten their their shit together a little bit in the in the athletic department. Obviously, the basketball team is not great right now, but um, it feels maybe not COVID. Like, yeah, I feel like there's uh, there's some there's some real momentum there, which is cool to see. What's the, what's the general as a as a person who lives in in Los Angeles? I don't have a lot of understanding. What is the general take on black uniforms for football? <laughs> have you been looking at my Twitter feed? No. Okay. I mean, so, I follow you on Twitter, but I'm not. I'm right. saying I haven't been like studying your Twitter feed. So, Paul, uh, this is a hot topic for me. Okay, okay I'm in. Um, I think the black uniforms are uh, an atrocity. Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge Matt Campbell fan, big Matt Campbell fan. But like, just because the guy is obsessed with black uniforms and the color black, like he's a great football coach. He's not a marketer and he's not a style icon here. Okay. He wears his hat. Like he, like it's 1996, like let's Mm -hmm. not do this, but we're just bending over backwards because he thinks black uniforms are cool and they've won some games in it. Mm-hmm. I think it's a terrible idea. Actually, I've actually screenshotted the Iowa State Marketing Department's page. They talk about why the school colors are important on the Iowa State website. And it specifically talks about why you need to use the school colors in uniforms, in advertising. And mm-hmm. they specifically say on the Iowa State Marketing website, why we do not use black in our color scheme, because it reminds everybody of the school out east. It says that on the Iowa State website. <laughs> But I'm well, called like an old fogey, you know, I'm not, well, I'm not hip look, with the times. I can, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm older than you, so I will only uh, bolster your old fogey, uh, the old fogey accusations, but I agree. But I, I actually have like, I think, I think what needs to be remembered about black as an alternate uniform color is that if your school only has one color, like Oklahoma, then that means that the offsetting color should either be probably black or white or dark gray or something. But if you already have two colors, introducing black as your offsetting color doesn't make any sense. Like, it, again, if you want to make that your full-time color, if you want to have Texas Tech's colors and be red and black, right. that's sure, do that. But yes, it to me, I've never even necessarily loved the red-gold combo because it's a little McDonald's-y, if we're honest. Um, but if those are your school colors, then you better just ride out with them. Well, and everybody's got a black alternate now. This isn't unique. It's not like a yeah. unique thing, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you turn on the game, and my wife's not a big sports fan. A lot of times she's like, oh, Iowa State's the black one? I thought Iowa State was the, you know, the other one, mm-hmm. right? She, and yeah. so there was just no for, – for Iowa State to play their two biggest games in football history in black uniforms was a massive miss for the Iowa State marketing department. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's the thing, right? It's all, it's all about branding. Uh, and you have to keep that consistency. Um, it's frustrating, but I'm, I'm in the minority on social media on that. Are oh. you? Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, I feel like being in the minority on social media is not an indicator of anything because right. there's, there's a silent majority out there that probably agrees with you. Right. Well, I know you're tight on time today. You've been bouncing from one, one zoom meeting to the next. So let's wrap things up with the five big questions, Paul. Okay. 
First question is, when is the first and last time that you dunked? Wow. Uh, okay. Last time I dunked, um, I, I would bet that I was at, in my parents' driveway because the, the old goal that we, I don't know if it's exactly the same goal that we grew up on, but it's in the same place. I'm sure that my brothers and I were, were messing around out there and on the concrete. I think, uh, I think I was able to still pull off a dunk. And the first time I dunked, was certainly in a basketball practice probably not in a high school practice but in a I when I was a kid grew up near Topeka Kansas and uh, but grew up in this small town that's where I went to school I would go into Topeka to play like summer league and YMCA basketball and um, through the YMCA program which is they'll just take all comers right you remember those days of like you you pay yep. your 35 bucks and then you get whatever six games and you're randomly assigned a team and there's going to be a kid that shows up in jeans on your team and that's going to be annoying but whatever that's how YMCA basketball works anyway I had heard rumblings that there was this other sort of secret league where the better players played and so mm -hmm. I remember walking up to this guy Lloyd Murphy uh, who worked with my dad and saying like, Hey, Mr. Murphy, I, I heard about this other league and I'd be interested in getting into it. And he's like, all right, well, I'll, I'll put you in touch. So this other league was like the guys who actually played high school basketball all mixed up. And um, my team was coached by a guy named Jim Gilbert. Um, he's actually in the book on the, in the dedications, he's the Jim of the Jim, Tim, et cetera, et cetera. So Jim Gilbert is this uh, black dude who's probably at the time, I don't know, 45, big goatee, kind of a beer gut. Um, and my team, I mean, so let's not mess around. I'm, I come from a school that's almost exclusively white kids from the farm farmland. And now I'm on a team that is me, one other white kid and all black dudes, right? And they're, they're good. So like first practice, uh, I go in, in East Topeka, I'm a freshman in high school. I'm six feet tall and weigh 125 pounds or something. And I would say if I didn't get every shot blocked, it was <laughs> 11 out of 12. Um, left that practice in tears with my mom who had taken me to practice. Um, and I remember so vividly that, uh, that Jim Gilbert was one of those first guys who's like, well, look, you can either give up now or work harder and see if you can catch up to these guys and so thankfully i i did and i remember so vividly that jim gilbert and all of the guys he was coaching he would always talk about the aggression needed to play well and so there was a lot of focus on dunking when you could dunk so we would have practices where for the first 20 minutes, it was just like layup lines where everybody was trying to dunk. And so I couldn't necessarily dunk at first, but being around all these dudes who were older than I was, who were more athletic than I was kind of bred this mentality in me that like, Oh, I got to dunk anytime I can. And then when I got to podunk big seven league in Kansas, the fact that I was dunking all the time, like would set the gym on fire. Oh yeah. Like what a guy's just dunking uh, in games. This is a unheard of. Uh, but to me, it had become so much a part of like the way that I played uh, that it wasn't distinguishable, you know? Yeah. In small town, like Midwest, and it was probably everywhere, probably not just the Midwest. It'll be like mm -hmm. Paul Shirley had 20 points and four dunks. Right. <laughs> right. You know, they, like, they there count your dunks as if they're worth, you know, right. like they're special, special points. You there know? was such an emphasis too on like, I was, you know, like the asshole for dunking the basketball. So those, the other teams. That showboat. Who's he think he is? Bill Walton. Right. The other teams would spend so much time, like just trying to keep me from dunking that they would like lose sight of the rest of my teammates. In day-to-day -day life out in Los Angeles, Paul, what do you miss most about the Midwest? Uh, you're going to, you're going to hate this answer, but uh, the cold weather. All right. Cause like, I think I don't hate that answer. I like the four seasons here in the Midwest. Yeah. I'm, I like everybody I've been, as, as you mentioned, I've been on a bunch of calls today and people were all over the place. Um, and they were showing, showing me pictures of snow. They're like, yeah, it snowed like a foot here and it's got another inch on the way. And that sounds so nice because I, I don't know if you, how you'll feel about this take, but I have a really hard time concentrating when it's sunny outside because I grew up in a place where if it's sunny, 
you better get your ass outside right. and do There's something chores to do. Nice weather. Yeah. So my brain, when it's nice, like it always is in LA is always just like, I should be outside. I should be outside. And I miss like just the, the sense of being in a coffee shop, huddled around a hot cup of coffee with my laptop and I'm writing and there's nowhere else to be because I might as well be there. Yeah. There's something great about, uh, you know, to me, uh, storms, rainstorms in the summer mean rainouts. So I, oh, mean, yeah. I get a day off. And mm-hmm. then, uh, also like in the winter, the snowstorm means like, Hey, we're not doing anything today. The whole yeah. city shut down. Yeah. I think there's, I actually think there's something within us as humans where we kind of need that hibernation. Like we need that like kind of shutdown mode and it's, that's hard for me to come by in LA. And I, I'm a bit of, I, uh, I'm honestly a little bit of workaholic tendencies. So I think if anything that just keeps me going means I just get more tired. So you mentioned Jim Gilbert there, and I know you had great coaches in college at Iowa state. Who's your favorite professional coach? Um, my, my gut says Mike D'Antoni, but I think that's kind of a cop out because I didn't have that much contact with him. So when I was in Phoenix, I was mostly watching the Phoenix Suns. I didn't really have a ton of time to like spend with him. So what I will say instead was, uh, is, and I've actually talked about Scott Wedman a lot, who was just an amazing coach for me uh, as a personal shooting coach. But similarly, I was, it felt like our time as with me as his player was kind of limited. I was coached by a guy named Bill Baino when I played in the CBA, Bill Baino had coached at UNLV and then had a pretty spectacular flame out where he was a young coach. He got into some trouble with like, uh, might've been some drugs and hookers or something like that in Vegas. It's a CBA baby. Well, no, this was when he was in college. Oh, so when, oh, he, UNLV. when he, yeah, when he coached at UNLV, he, he had like kind of went through a bit of a scandal, sort of like Quinn Snyder in a way. Um, and then when he resurfaced in the CBA, he was he was really humble. He was totally bought in on like, I'm going to make this CBA team as good as it possibly can be. And I remember like loving how he didn't care where I had come from. He didn't, he didn't know anything about my past. He just liked that I played the game the right way. And so I really flourished under him and cool. felt like, I don't know. It felt like a really positive and um, productive relationship, whereas some coaches who I think are more insecure are never able to open up, be vulnerable enough to, to be like he was. Do you have like a bucket list sporting event that you'd like to go to as a fan? Oh, man. Um, let's see. Let's see. I, I, I think a World Series game that the Kansas City Royals are playing in. Oh, uh, yeah. Like I'm such a Royals fan and a baseball fan in general. Um, I don't, there's like, you wouldn't, it's hard to get me to go to a basketball game. So there, there's not going to be one of those. And I feel like a Super Bowl game is not going to be mm-hmm. that cool, but a world series game. Like if it's the Kansas city Royals playing the, whatever, uh, the Dodgers, but in Kansas city, that would be, that would be it for me. I got talked into the night before game seven Dodgers giants, Madison Bumgarner on the mound, you know, in mm-hmm. Kansas city, Buddy calls me up at 11 o'clock the night before the game. He's like thousand bucks for a ticket. And I wasn't married yet, you know? And so Mm -hmm. like do irrational things. He's like, when is there ever going to be a game seven within driving distance? We got to go. And we went and it was awesome. Was it? Yeah. It was incredible. In some of those things, you, it's almost like you have to detach from the monetary value of that specific ticket because you have to be thinking about like, well, what's the, what other bargains have I gotten away with where I had an amazing right. time? So therefore it's going to be averaged out so that like over the course of my life, I've paid X for baseball tickets and I've had so many good experiences because of that. And this one just happens to cost more. Right. It was way better deal than like the $200 fast pass at Disney world. <laughs> right. Still standing in line for all day. You know, it's like game seven of the world series. This is a once in a lifetime deal. Right. You can buy the fast pass again tomorrow. And you get a coupon for it. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Final question then, Paul. I know you're a big baseball fan and uh, you're also a card collector. So Mm -hmm. when's the last time you bought maybe one one single card? Cards are hot right now. Or just, you know, we're in Target and bought a pack of cards. What? Like, back me up. Cards are hot right now? Oh, Paul. Cards are hot right now. Really? 
Yeah, you know that Gary V, who's an entrepreneur. He's an entrepreneur yep. out in New York City. He's yep. like a sports agent now. He's just a you know, right. A lot of it is from him. He's driving a lot of it, but but cards, sports cards, right now are as hot as they've been since like '93. Wow, I gotta I gotta get back to Meriden and get into those those baseball card collections. Um, it's becoming like a it's becoming like um, day trading type of thing. Okay. Like if Steph Curry has a good game or Luka Doncic, some of these young players right. has a good game last night. His card prices rocket up and then people are trading them and that Whoa. type of thing's going on on the internet right now. What a world, man. This is like, uh, there's a, there's a clip where um, <laughs> late in the internet DMX is, is shown the internet for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's serious completely, but he does a pretty good job if it's not serious of, of uh look making it look like it's the first time he's ever accessed the internet this is like you explaining to me this whole baseball card thing i feel like i i should have known about this this is crazy yeah Um, your frank white your frank white cards you know still 25 cents a card right but what about those like uh like that uh i think i have i think maybe my best what is my best card fuck i think i have a probably hmm I don't know. I don't even know anymore. Maybe like a, see, all these guys are not that interesting. I have a pretty decent, like Ken Griffey Jr. rookie card, I think somewhere. So like yeah, those are, those are still valuable. A lot of the stuff that probably you and I have though, like from the eighties mm-hmm. and nineties. Yeah. It, nobody cares. Yeah. Like the Griffey stuff is valuable and, right. but it's few and far between like yeah. the, you know, the Billy Butlers of the world and that type of stuff, you know, those right. are put them in the spokes of your, right. of your, Okay. Uh, so you so to, recently to answer your question i haven't bought a baseball card in ages i wish that i had and i think i should do that soon and you have inspired me to do exactly that you're welcome paul nothing else if nothing else so yeah let's uh i'll buy some baseball cards and then let's do a, a guided viewing of uh iowa state michigan state let's do it well, Paul, love Ball Boy. Thanks for sending it over to me. It was a really great be- read, a really fun read. You know, Thanks, I, I will say it was a really fun read. Um, so good luck with the book. Thanks for coming on the Moonlight Graham Show. Where can people find Ball Boy? Go to Amazon. Uh, I wish I could tell you that uh, it's going to be in your tiny little bookstore, but now's not the time for that. It's going to be easier to find it on the old Amazon. Head over to Amazon, purchase Ball Boy. It's a great book. Comes with a five-star review from the Moonlight Graham Show. Yes. All Thanks. right, Paul. Yes. Thanks for coming on. Thanks to you guys. And uh, a quick hello to everyone who uh, who's ever, you know, followed me, supported me. It's been much appreciated and a big part of uh, the fun of having been an Iowa State uh, alum. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Hey guys, thanks once again to listening to today's episode of the Moonlight Graham Show. And even though I do most of the interviews here on the podcast, there is a ton of work that happens behind the scenes that you guys don't see that make each episode possible. So I got to give a shout out to the Moonlight Graham Show team. First of all, Brian Sandvig, our producer. Brian does all of the post-production work. And in real life, he's not just a podcast producer. He's also a real estate agent. So if you're looking to buy or sell a home, down in the Kansas or Missouri areas, give Brian Sandvig a call. Next guy on that list is Brendan Gargano. Brendan does all of our design and artwork here on the podcast. He's one of the most talented artists I've ever met, and I love all of his work. If you need any help on the design side with logos or anything like that, give Brendan Gargano a call. The next guy on that list is Andy Flattery, my older brother. Andy, of course, has done some of the of the interviews here on the podcast. He also is a certified financial planner. He owns a business called Simple Wealth Planning. If you need any help in that area, check Andy Flattery out. And then, of course, the trusty co-host, Tom Griffin, and my younger brother, Neil Flattery. Those guys are just busy being husbands, being fathers. They're family men, but also they do a ton of work here on the show. So thanks again for listening. We really appreciate you guys subscribing and supporting the Moonlight Graham Show.